All right. Where are we up to now? So we left you uh, by Shemot, right? Then there was Bo Bishalach, that was the Makot. And then, of course, they left Mitzrayim. Then, of course, Bishalach was uh, Az Yashir, Shiratayam. Okay, I mean, that's a big one, but let's not go backwards. After Bishalach was Parshat Yitro, we're going to mention it today. Parshat Yitro, of course, Yitro was Moshe's father-in-law. Uh, he merited to have a parsha named after him. That's a big deal. He was a good father-in-law. He was a father-in-law that gave advice to his son-in-law. Where do you ever get that working? But And actually, the son-in-law took the advice. That was great. Um, what's unique about Parshat Yitro, of course, is the Aseret Adibra. That I want you to know because we're going to mention it today. Hi, Melissa. I see him. And um, yeah, so that's Yitro is Aseret Adibra. After that is Mishpatim, which we're going to touch upon in a minute. That's the one last Shabbos was Mishpatim. And this week's parasha is Teruma. Teruma is the beginning of many parashiyot that talks about the building of the Mishkan. The Mishkan was a mobile unit that was with them throughout their stay in the Midbar, like a mini Beit HaMikdash. Hi, Esther Dan. Like that, okay? Regards from your daughter, I had her this morning. All right, here we go. Before we do anything, the first thing I always, I personally believe, and as the, the years progress, and as I watch the news, you know I do a lot, and now that I, I'm, you know, I'm home more than I'm in school, I see the news more. This message is probably the most important message, especially if you live in a woke society. If you don't know what the word woke means at this point, uh, I don't know where you've been. So let me just tell you what's really, really important from Parshat Mishpatim. Here we go. I say this all the time, but it's really uh, big. All right. So this is last week's Parsha. okay? Last week's Parsha, which is, again, Mishpatim follows Yitro, right? Begins with the words, Ve'ele ha-mishpatim asher lifnaya. Everybody stops and asks the question that you should ask also. This is the beginning of a new chapter. Okay, this is, look, you see Aleph. Aleph means Pasuk Aleph. Perek Chaf Aleph, Pasuk Aleph. So it's not a continuation of the previous parasha. It's not a story. It's not a storyline at all. It's about to discuss a whole bunch of rules. Rules, right? If somebody uh, harms somebody, if somebody burns somebody's field down, you know, mostly ben adam mostly between person and person. So the Avi question, and girls, ladies, again, I, I want to always point out that these little things are not little things. These are these are words that Hashem wrote. So there's got to be a lesson here. And the obvious question, from a grammatical point of view, is how do you start a sentence with the letter? No, fill in the blank. V. How do you start a sentence with the letter V? But the word letter V means and. But not, it's not only a sentence, guys. It's an entire different Torah portion. It's an entire different chapter. So there is no connection. That's an obvious question, right? So Rashi brings down the Gemara, right? Let's see what Rashi says. Asks Rashi, or says Rashi, when it just says the words, these are, right, it does not connect it to something pretty. Rashi is saying, obviously, right? That's a grammatical concept. If you say the and, you're connecting to what happened. So what's the connection? Because what did we just finish? Yitro, which I told you, the highlight of Yitro is the what? The Aseret Hadibrot, says Rashi. Well, it's not Rashi, the Gemara says, Maharishonim Misinai, Af Elu Misinai. Let me say that again in English. Just like everybody knows, you've all seen the movie, that the Ten Commandments, right, come from what? That's like the biggie. They come from Hashem. They were from Har Sinai. These two were from Har Sinai. Okay, I got it. Okay, so you know what? I, I'm not going to complain, which means we want to point out right away that's a fair lesson. You know, that when it comes to religion, when it comes to orthodoxy, yeah, there is no such thing as the 10 big ones. There's no such thing, right? Which means 
Yes, there are certain rules about certain things that you have to give up your life for. You don't have to give up your life for. But you're not going to say that this mitzvah is it, right? I keep kosher, and therefore I can be Michal Shabbat. That does not that works. There's 613 mitzvot. We are commanded to do all of them. So, yes, okay, I, I, I'm okay with that. And, and, and the Rashi, and the, I mean, not Rashi, Hashem is saying that don't think that our religion surrounds the 10 big ones. Fair? But it's much deeper. And remember, I always tell you this is a really important lesson. I would love for you to share it with your fam. Here we go. The, the Pasha is called Mishpati. Our mitzvot are divided into Chukim and Mishpati. You should know by now, from all the times that I've said it, what is the difference between a Chok and a Mishpat? A Chok I can't mishpat. hear him. You can't and I have a, I don't have it on mute. I don't know. Can everybody else hear me? Him? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, let me see. Who's asking me that? Who's saying you can't hear me? Yeah, I have my... Okay. I have my... Yola. Okay, do you got it now? Yola. Oh. All right. I don't know. I didn't always do well with every woman, so we'll do the best we can. I don't know. Okay, here we go. Oh, I hope you didn't hear that. Right. Chukim and Mishpati. Every, I, I, okay, I don't want to make anybody feel bad if you don't know it. So Chukim are the laws that we don't know the reason for. We don't understand. That doesn't mean they don't have a reason. We just don't understand. Like shotness. You know, everybody knows what shotness is. You can't have wool and linen together. You, you might be interesting that, that, that some rabbis say, Chazir, yeah, we don't necessarily know the actual reason. We're saying it's a dirty animal, it's got different, uh, you know, uh, it's signs, whatever. It's not 100%. Uh, para duma, we don't know those things. Mishpatim are laws for which we know the reason. They make sense, right? So as a matter of fact, by the way, something I never told you, let's just take a side show. There's a fascinating Rambam. I don't know if you're gonna like it, but I'm gonna tell it to you anyway. Fascinating, Rambam was a philosopher, besides being a doctor. The Rambam asks a basic, simple question. Is it okay for a person to have a yetahara to do something the Torah says not to do? Interesting. So the Rambam makes a difference between Hukim or Ben Adam Lechavero and Ben Adam Lamakom. He's saying if a person walks by a McDonald's and says, Whoa, I'd love to taste a cheeseburger. You know, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I want to know. It looks like it's good. Is that a bad thing to be, to feel? Rambam says, no, that's not a bad thing. It's a natural thing, right? And therefore, if you say, oh, you know, I, I would love a cheeseburger. I, I don't know, is this cheeseburger turning anybody on here? Am I saying the wrong thing here? I don't know, you want to give me something else? No? Non-kosher filet mignon? I don't know. Did you notice I'm always going with food? No, okay. So, if a, you know, if a person has this tremendous desire and says, but I don't do that because God says no. That's okay. But if a person walks around saying, you know, I would love to kill you, but God mm -hmm. said, oh, okay, so maybe they should work on their midot, you know? I, so so that, the Ramam discusses that. Got it. But here we're going to go a little deeper. And based on this, and I love this pasuk. So if you could write it down and learn it with your family, because it's simple. It's a pasuk in Vayikra. But again, who am I quoting here? It's called the Lord, okay? This is how Hashem wrote this pasuk. Look at it carefully, very carefully. Va'asitem et chukotai, nice. Perform my chukim, do it, right? Do the mitzvahs. That mishpatai tishmeru va'asitem. Right there, let's do that again, guys. This is not crazy Besser making this up. Again, God said, do or perform the chukim and keep, right? Perform them and keep them. Lishmor and lasso. Why? If, if, if the word lishmor is important, do it in both. Says the commentary. By chukim, the Torah says, you will do my chukim. And by mishpatim, the Torah uses the language guard. Why the change in verb from do to guard? The interpretation is, that the main test or temptation when it comes to chukim is that they do not make sense. You got it? Right? I, I know. I don't understand it. Maybe I won't do it. There's no logic, right? To observing the laws of Shatos Akash. 
Therefore, do it. God says, even though you don't understand it, do it. However, Mishpatim, there's a different test. Everyone knows that it's not right to steal. Everybody knows that it's not right to kill. So what's the test? Just to do it doesn't mean you believe in God. The test is not to go ahead and put parameters on the law based on our own understanding, which means don't change the parameters. We should not say the reason for this law must be such and such, and therefore I can change the situation. Listen to the lesson. Anybody ever, uh, what's his name? New, uh, Shapiro, what's Shapiro's name? New? New? Ben uh, Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. Shapiro. I'm ben. a big Ben Shapiro fan. I don't know if you are or aren't. He does fantastically well when he goes to college campuses. Have you ever seen them when he goes there? He gets up in front of hundreds of people and they ask him questions. Carrie, was that a thumbs up or that was just orange juice? Yeah, thumbs up. Got it. I saw yeah, a piece. I've heard him speak. He's he knows Nobody's, how to get his audience. He's on his feet. He's like that. Yes, yes. He was taking questions from the audience. And unfortunately, it sounded like a Jewish girl. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Okay. She got up and she uh, went up against him because he had said that genders are pre-done by Hashem. Hashem makes boys. Hashem makes girls. And biologically, that's the way they are people go through life and have different feelings, they're not a girl because they feel like a girl. And they're not a boy because they feel like a boy. They are a boy and they are a girl. And that's it. Right? Okay. This girl gets up and starts fighting with him. No, no. If a boy feels like a girl, he's a girl. And, and that's what's going on in America. Do you guys know this? Do you know what's going on with gender? You're not allowed to call a person a boy or a girl anymore. Do you know that when they talk about pregnant people, they now say, People, not mothers. Are you guys on, on top of this at all? This all, yeah, I, yeah. Peggy, you're lucky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, wait, Peggy, I'm going to put on a shaitel because I like shit. No, I'm kidding. So, yeah, which means what's happening in the world today? We're so afraid of, 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 of hurting people's feelings. And we shouldn't be afraid of hurting people's feelings. If you feel something, you're, that's it. You're right. You're right. Therefore, if I feel that I could do this, I'm able to do this. Okay, I don't want to get too political. I'm upset about something happens in the news. I can go and ransack your store. I'm really sorry. This is, I'm not talking Democrats, Republicans now, girls. I'm talking about the world, right? And how many leaders in this world says, yeah, listen, they're upset about something so they can go, right, and loot my store. No, no, Taurus says you're not allowed to do that. And you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. If somebody does something wrong to you, you have no right to do something back to them. That's Torah. That's Mishpatim. Mishpatim are not up to us to decide. Just like the Ten Commandments come from God, whatever Hashem says, that's the right thing to do. That's a very big lesson. We don't budge from the Torah. And sometimes it's difficult. The moment you take Hashem out of the equation, the moment you say that Mishpatim don't come from Sinai, right? Then you make your own rules. And if you look at Parshat Mishpatim, it's full of, you know, money thing, uh, this thing, this thing, like that. I, I, basic concepts that are not up to the person to decide. So therefore it says Ve'ela. Now let's get a little more, a little more serious here. All right, you, this you've seen me say. Growing share, say belief in God is not necessary to have good values, right? But look, I, I like this next one even more. Even low, low in this week, in, in, in the same Barshat Mishpatim, lo tihiyeh acharei rabim liraot. Lo tihiyeh acharei rabim liraot. You do not follow the majority for evil which means if you establish a government and something, right, is going to be, uh, this is so up to date with what we need. If something is evil, now who decides what's evil? What's the answer to that question, girls? Who decides what's evil? Hashem. The Torah, Hashem decides. So if something is evil, even if you have a government where the majority of the government is voting, you don't go after the majority. And it's so, look at this. The Torah is talking to us in our life. 
So now you're going to make a decision of what becomes allowed and not allowed based on, on a majority of senators, a majority of people. All of a sudden, you know, I say this all the time, but it's true. Look, abortion, uh, other issues. Issues are not decided by human majority. Have a good day. Would you tell your kids, what do we tell our kids about peer pressure, right? What's the famous thing? Just because everybody's jumping off the bridge, you're going to jump off the bridge? If it's not allowed, it's not allowed. And that's a decision made by God. So Mishpatim don't change. Okay, enough screaming. Everybody got it? But it's a very important concept in our life today. And that's why that Bob is there. Okay? I'd like to connect it. Uh, oh, I love this saying, by the way. You see the saying? It's by Dennis Prager. Without Hashem, without God and religion, you don't have moral truth. You have moral opinion, right? People who have their own opinion, that's their morality. Okay, you know what? Let me just go over the line. I, I, I do it often, but understand the danger, ladies. Understand the danger of allowing humans to decide what's yes and what's not. The danger is that it can go so far that a person can take his country, demagogues can take their country. I don't even want to say his name. The man who created the horrible country in 1940 and 1938 and make them think that that's the right thing to do. And this is how far it can go. Because if all it takes is a majority, and if all it takes is somebody thinking their opinion is the right opinion, we got a problem. We got a big problem. And then, of course, when it comes to, you know, uh, end of life issues, everybody has opinions, right? You can convince somebody that it's important to kill them because they're suffering. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in that. We don't believe that if somebody is suffering, we pull the plug. We don't believe in that because the Torah says no. Okay. All right. Well, no, no comments. No comments. Okay. Everybody's nice today because they feel bad for me. Okay, we can skip this next part. All right, so I want to show you something beautiful that it connects, this lesson connects to something in this week's parasha. Okay, this week's parasha is parasha Truma, right? And parasha Truma talks about the Mishkan. Okay, what is the most uh, famous? No, I don't like famous. What would you say is the most, uh, the word important is not good either, the most most known or maybe the holiest vessel in the Mishkan. Come on. The Aron Kodesh. The Aron Kodesh, right. Right, remember that movie, right? The Lost Ark. Was it Rangers of the Lost Ark? I forgot what it's called. Raiders, Raiders. Raiders, Raiders thank you. Eleanor, even the movies you're on top of. You didn't see that? It was a fun movie. No, oh, okay, awesome. Right. So Freda doesn't let me go to movies. What am I supposed to do? Right, uh, okay. Raiders of the Lost Ark. So the Aron. If I ask you to have an image in your head of the Aron, what are you seeing? Well, the Kruvim was one. You see the Kruvim. Good. What was it made out of? Uh, the Kruvim were gold. Yeah, and what about the Aron? The Aron was acacia wood. Acacia uh, wood. Wood or gold? Both. Oh, 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 so if you have a vision of the Aron, if you put image of the Aron of the Aron in the Mishkan on your computer, you're going to see a box of gold. That's what you're going to see, because it was made out of gold. But now yeah. Eleanor just said, "Whoa, made out of wood." Where did Eleanor get this from? Because Eleanor knows the Torah. And in this week's parsha, it says, "Okay, let me get this out of the way." The Asu Aron Atzeshitim. Make the ark of acacia woods, right? I'd say Shitim is a very good uh, uh, that that gets its own story. But wait a minute, wait a minute. The Aron was gold, right? So where does wood come into the gold? Is the question. So believe it or not, Rashi said something amazing. And if you if you never heard this, know it now. Says Rashi, and I even have a picture for you guys. Look at that. Oh, uh, let me. I gotta get your pictures out of the way. Yeah, here we go. Shlosha Aronot Asa Bitzal. By the way, Bitzal El was the contractor, was the architect of the Aron. And Emir Tashem, the next week or two weeks, uh, we'll talk about why Bitzal El was chosen to be the architect. He was very young, by the way. 
We had a great, we had a great construction uh, company. But Hashem so, told me to make three. three, three what happened? Three inch up. Uh oh, what happened now? To make three. Everybody good? Okay. To make three. Uh, share screen. Yeah. To make three boxes. Okay. Can you see the three boxes? But I'm going to read Rashi, right? Right? Uh, or uh, in, in English. But Sal made three arcs. Two of gold and one of wood. Two of gold. So you got an outer one, right? That was made out of gold. Then the inside was wood. Go into what? Into the outer one, in, you know, in and out of gold. And then another one on top of it to have gold. So you don't see the wood at all. Not at all. All you see is an outside of gold, and you don't even, you guys with me? You don't even see the third one. You basically see gold, but there is a hidden one inside, right, uh, of wood. Why? I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. No? Why? If you don't even see it, you, you can't tell me it's for support. You don't think you don't think gold is strong enough to hold? Girl, somebody tell me something. Gold is not strong enough to hold? The answer is gold enough is strong enough. Just go like this. Yes, gold is strong enough to hold. Good. Class participation, 100%. So what's the point of having the woods if it's totally hidden? I'm ready for somebody. I know one thing is that Avram planted the Atsashi Tim. Femo, and- yeah. yeah, yeah. And Yaakov uh, carried them through. Took them down to Mitzrayim. Very good, Eleanor. That's a whole discussion. I, I mean, so I, I include I, both the most expensive with something that's the mo- that maybe not the most expensive in the Kodesh Hakodeshim. It's to teach a valuable lesson in life. So that's it's the beginning of a, an answer. I'm not just trying to be nice to you. And therefore, I mean, that's like, not my like point. it's for everyone. Like the Torah is for everyone, from the simple to Oh, okay. So now we're most extravagant. Like how when we're buried, we're all buried in a wood box. Oh my gosh, you go, whoa, Erica, man, you went the mile on that one. But all right, all right, all right. Uh, I, I, what is uh, as is grounds us? It comes from the earth and it grounds us around whoa, the gold. Whoa, whoa. Okay, so I tell you what. So we're going to take everybody's answer here, and they were all very, very good. And we're going to say that the first lesson, which is not my main point, the main point is something else. But the first lesson is, how about if we say, everybody who just said that, that wood reminds us of humility. How's that? How's that? Is that good? Agree? Uh, Humility because it's cheaper. Humility because we get buried in it. We come from the ground. Okay, I got it. So yes, that is the first answer. The first answer is that the Aaron, of course, is what? Represents the Torah, the Torah. Is. That's where the luchot were. And a person who's a ben Torah, right? A person, a ben Torah, but doesn't mean not a woman. You understand? The uh, 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 individual of Torah, a Torah person, has to have inside humility, right? Inside, but on the outside, feel important that they are representing Hashem. Nice lesson. Good. So therefore, it's there. Now I want to go for a deeper lesson. And this lesson I heard from the former chief rabbi of Eretz Israel. Ready? Gold is solid. Solid. That's why we call it solid gold. That's why we like gold. But there's one thing that gold can't do that wood can do. What is that? Go of water. It what? It doesn't rot. It doesn't, it doesn't decompose. Oh, so that's why gold is right. Wood decomposes, right? And gold doesn't, so gold is solid. I got it. Give me something that I'm not saying who's better or worse. Give me something that <laughs> Sephardi is trying to give the answer. No, we're not letting Sephardi take the answer. <laughs> but, birds. Okay, I need something good, not something bad. Give me something. No, no, Sephardi. That was a great answer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was terrible. Yes. Ready? <laughs> what can wood do that gold can never do? Wood can, can it absorb. It does slow. So, she got it. can absorb things. Bend. She goes, bend. On my way to work with bones. Grow. And he didn't tell me. I didn't tell her in advance. (laughs) Except except for 10 minutes before the class. I know, I'm kidding. Wood has the ability to grow. Gold can't grow. Now listen to the depth. 
Torah is surrounded by gold and gold. However, within the Torah, things can change based on the growth of the person and the growth of life. I'll give you a simple example. You ready? Here we go. There was a man 30 years ago, Rob Wall. Uh, uh, Baldinger, forget his first name. I don't remember his first name. Ready? Was asked the following question. Are you allowed, Alpi Torah, to donate a kidney? What was his psak halacha based on Torah? What do you think? Yes. 30 years ago. Yes. He said no. No. Halachically speaking, do you guys remember the famous pasuk and the Gemara about two guys walking in the desert, and you have only one canteen of water. You remember that? Yes. And the Torah says, v'chai achicha imcha, your brother has to live with you. You're first, your brother is second. If two people are on the, uh, what's that called? Titanic, right? And I have the life jacket and you don't. As much as I love you, I don't have to give it to you, right? I, I can save myself. My life comes first. So therefore, going into a sakana, right? Going into a danger, a serious danger, in order to save somebody else is not allowed. So there's the Torah. There's the Torah. Torah says no. Chacham Ovadia Yosef, may he rest in peace, was asked about eight years, ten years ago, can you donate a kidney? What do you think he answered? Yes. Yes, yes and it's a mitzvah to do it. What happened? What happened? Because there's growth. Because there's growth in the medical society. And once there's growth in the medical society, that growth influences the Torah. But the Torah is still encased within solid gold. So yes, there is room for growth. I, I don't want to get into trouble, but education today in the yeshiva system is not the way it used to be. It's, I, I don't know how to say this for those of you who are, it's better than it used to be. It's better than it used to be. I see what my our grandchildren are getting in school from their rabbis, from their young and you, you know, I, I, you're going to tell me I'm crazy. Do you know that my grandchildren, I think they feed them every night another type of supper. There's chunk on Thursday. There's poppers on Monday. And they run, they run. They love, they love the prizes. They love the thing. That's, that's, I'm sorry. That's what we have to do today. Yeah, we have to entertain the kids today. Does that mean that the other rabbis were bad? No, but there's growth. You have to allow yourself to grow, but within the Torah parameters. Did you like that one? Yeah, just say yes to make me feel good. Yeah, but I, I, I really think that that's it. And that's the lesson. So yeah, the Eila Mishpatim, we do understand that sometimes we have to adapt, but it's all based on Torah, which means within the Torah guidelines, that, and we can't just say, you know, ah, you want to make the person feel good. You know, that one of the hardest questions, the hardest questions, that rabbis, and, and that's why the conservative movement started, but look what happened. Look what happened. They're, they're not here. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a scenario. The Holocaust survivor who lives somewhere in the, in, in the suburbs, he's, he's 89 years old, he's got your type for everyone who died in Auschwitz, and he wants to know if he's allowed to drive to shul to say Kaddish. What's the answer, girls? What's the answer? No. No. The answer is no. As hard as it is to say that to a person, as difficult as it is to say to a person like that, we can't sit there and say, you know, we don't want to make them feel bad. I want you to know Chabad is the biggest cure of organization, but they still stick within their law, the law of Torah. They're not going to water down the Torah. If somebody is not Jewish because their father is Jewish and their mother is not Jewish, you don't say, Hazid, I feel bad, you know. I, I didn't say be not nice to them. But they're not Jewish. That's the law. That's the halacha. Finished. Okay. All right. It's, it's really important. So, yes, change can happen, but within the goal. Okay. So we have two reasons. You guys gave a great reason, by the way. Okay. Here we go. I don't know if you guys, I'm not trying to promote myself, but I don't know if you guys watch the Torah Takeaway. You guys do that? Do you know that uh, Rabbi Galbert sets up that every day during vacation, there were two teachers who gave a Dvar Torah? Did you guys know that? It yeah. was great, Rabbi. We listen to it every day. Thank you. So now you can hear part of it again. So they asked me to do once. I did it, but I want to take it 
And you know what? I could just stop and play it for you, and then I don't have to teach. But okay, it, it was three minutes. But I want to take it, but I want to take it further, a little further, okay? Because I want to bring it into something that we've never discussed, and that's going to be mezuzah. You'll see where I'm going. Let me just get the first part out, which I'm very excited about. The first part is also good, and then we'll go. Okay, it's just a, it's really a mindset. All right, here we go. So what I pointed out that last week's parsha was mishpatim, right? And uh, this week is Tirumah. So sometimes the Torah uses a word that's unique, and that word teaches us something special. If you've never heard this, you should hear it now, because it's a great one, and then I'm going to go to the new thing I want to do. Let's ask a basic question. You see the, the uh, bold question here? Since Hashem knows our thoughts, why do we need to make our prayers audible? Why don't we just stand there and think? You know, I, Why do we have to say anything? So there's a pasuk in this past week's parsha that has a word that's weird. Again, it's mishpatim. So here's the case. This is very famous, by the way. Two people are fighting. You can see the scene. Two guys are fighting. A pregnant woman walks by. The guy ducks. He hits the pregnant woman. And she miscarries. Again, what happens is this is a, a typical case of mishpatim. This is a court case, right? Two people are fighting. A woman by mistake gets hit. If she dies, of course, that's a whole other rule, but she didn't die. She lost her children. She miscarried. So this becomes a money sue. You sue money, right? Who sues? The husband of the wife who miscarried sues the guy who hit, and he goes to court. But here's the word. Ready? Let's do this quick because it's famous. Venatan biflilim. There you go. Venatan biflilim says the English. The English quotes the what? The uh, no, the unculus, and he goes to the judges. How do you say judges in Hebrew, girls? Shoftim. Shoftim. Give me another word. Dayanim. No? Never heard Dayanim? Yeah. Okay. Dayanim or Shoftim. I never heard up until now, or unless you heard this from me once, the word Felilim. What's Felilim? So Rashi says it's Dayanim, and Unculus says Dayanim. Why is Hashem doing this, and what does it teach us? So there's a very famous rabbi, I always quote him, his name is Rav Shamshon Raphael, give me his last name, no? Hirsch, Hirsch, Hirsch. Very, very famous, he's a very big linguist, he always goes into grammatical concepts, and he says, very nicely, for those who never heard it again, lifalel therefore means to judge, right? To judge. What does a judge do, girls? Give me in your own, in your own words. But don't say my words that I said on the Torah takeaway. What does a judge do? What's the job of a judge? He decides between the two parties who's justified. How does he do that? By uh, deciding um, who has right on I'm their looking side. looking at the and evidence. Who... Right. He has to listen to both sides. Right. Okay, I'm going to use the word assess, right? He assesses the situation, and he decides by clearing up what's the truth and what's not true, right? Says Rabbi Hirsch. Let me show it to you inside so we go fast. Says Rabbi Hirsch. Let's go to this. Shimshon Rafael Hirsch writes, the root word for prayer is lifalel, which means to judge. We now take the word lifalel and we make it into heat pael, right? Reflexive. Reflexive means that you do it to yourself. Prayer requires a truthful self-analysis. Very nice. So Rabbi Hirsch says that the goal of tefillah is not to tell Hashem what's going on, but to talk to ourselves to clarify what our life is really all about. What are we asking for? We're asking for Fainu. Who are we talking to? There is a true God in the world. So the goal of tefillah, lehit palel, is to take the time out to clarify what's good, what's bad, what's truth or not. Isn't that nice? That's Rabbi Hirsch. Nice. So I, what I said on the Torah takeaway, that that, go, and this prayer doesn't change God, it changes us. And that goes right into our parsha. This is the most famous line of all the Mishkan lines. Guys, it's like huge. The Asuli Migdash, this week's parsha, Make for me a, a mishkan v'shachanti v'tocham. Make for me a midash, and I will dwell in them. In them. It should have said in 
it. <laughs> the answer is God doesn't need the shul. God doesn't need the mishkan. God doesn't need the prayer. All of those experiences are to inspire us to bring God within us. Got it? That's the goal of tefillah. That's the goal of a shul. That's the goal of going to shul. That's the goal of having a mishkan. That's the goal of having a beautiful shul. God doesn't need the gory places, right? God wants to give us a chance. By the way, so I show, which I never said because it's a little dangerous. Do you know that according to many people, the parshiot are not in the right order? In two weeks, and hopefully we'll have a class then with God's help, is parshat kitisa, that's the story of the Egel Hazahav, the Egel, right? The, the, uh, the, uh, who? Golden the, uh, calf, golden golden calf. calf. Golden calf. Wow. Wow, I just blanked on that. That's my Israeli background. Yes, the golden calf. Got it. You know, English is my second language, girls. You do know that, right? All right, so here we go. So um, a lot of people say that Parshat Truma, which is the Mishkan, came after the golden calf. You guys are with me? Right. So I want to give you just a deep thought. We'll play on this in two weeks. Why all of a sudden did Hashem decide to have a Mishkan, right? Why now? Maybe Hashem saw that humans need a medium, right? They need something symbolic to latch onto in order to be inspired. Interesting concept, by the way. You follow? It's because originally God didn't want it that way, right? You want to get close to God, get close to God. But maybe from the ego story, the uh, an actual, you know, uh, object that they could look at, oh, so now let's get a shul, let's get a mishkan. But again, the mishkan is for who? It's, it's for, not for Hashem, right? It's for us. Agreed? Everybody got it. And then, so now I want to do take this a step further because I happen to have a uh, class about whatever this, and this came up. What's the goal of a mezuzah? What's the goal of a mezuzah? Somebody want to tell me? To protect Protection. the home. Oh, to protect our homes, right? Okay. okay. Be careful how you quote me here. This goes into a slippery slope challenge. Really, that's how it works. If I wear something, I'm protected. I got a hamsa on my body. That's it. That's it, right? That's all I need to do. If Hashem, if I need Hashem to protect me, I'm going to put a little item by my door, and now I'm protected. Are you sensing my cynicism? Yeah. Do you understand that this needs to be understood? Because this goes into these amulets, right? Really, that's how things work. I, like, it has nothing to do with me. I, I get a little thing, and then I'm good, right? No Ayn Hara is going to get me because I'm wearing garlic. Yay! You guys don't know that, right? You guys know about garlic? Yeah. Anybody? Keep away the Hamada. vampires. Yeah. Um, don't laugh. This is Hamada never garlic when you were a kid? How about a red string? Red <laughs> string, I know. Red string, I know. Yes. Are you kidding? My, my, my mother would put red string all, all my suits. The girls I went out with wanted to wonder why all my buttons had red strings on them. But garlic also. But my mother, who was very neat and clean and, and very smelled good, she would take the garlic, put it in the pouch, and douse the pouch in perfume. So I had a pouch with a piece of garlic in it that smelled like perfume. Then you wonder why I started wearing cologne? Okay, so that's, okay. Do we believe in that stuff? So listen to what the Rambam says. And I, I, I hope that either you'll agree or you won't be upset. So the Rambam says the following. Here we go. There's a picture of mezuzah. There's a reason I, I put two of them up in a minute. The purpose of the mezuzah is to act as a constant reminder of Hashem's presence. Jews will touch and kiss the mezuzah, right? As it says in the Torah. I mean, Torah says to put it up. Now we can understand how the mezuzah protects the house. A Jewish home, which is a miniature temple, is a vessel of holiness. A door opening to a strange and often hostile world is thus called evil. Which means, let me explain to you what the Rambam is saying. Which means, you know what the, oh, what's this doing here? You know what the protection is? I look at the mezuzah, and what happens? What happens? Think of Hashem. I think of Hashem, thank you. It's not the mezuzah that protects us. It's the mezuzah that inspires me to realize I'm walking into a Jewish home. There is a Hashem in my life. And once that happens, I get protected. Do you see the difference? 
No, it's not a mezuzah on its own. I don't build a shul and now the shul is there. No, no, I build a shul to inspire me. That's what works, right? I pray to inspire me, not to tell Hashem what he needs for me to do. And therefore I put up a mezuzah to inspire me. You like it? It's the same concept. It's exactly the same thing. Now this I never saw. If you like Hebrew, look at this. Girls, how do you say, okay, no, let me not show it. Let me not show it. How do you say apartment? Or what? Dira. Dira. Very good. Dalid, Yud, Reish, Hey. Everybody knows. You go to Israel, and it's a Dira. Anybody by any wild, <laughs> wild chance knows how do you say a, uh, a stable for animals? Sorry, I saw it, but it was deer. Who Dalid said Yud, Reish? How did you Oh, because I had it open. You had it on good. You're good. Hashem's presence, the hay. Oh, how nice is that, right? So here we go. In the Hebrew, the word for human dwelling is dira, as we know, while the word for animal dwelling, because he didn't want to say the word stable, is a deer. The difference between these two words is hay, which means what is the point of the mezuzah? When you walk into your home, don't make it a stable, right? Remember who you are. Remember who God is in your life. And then you get protected. Now I feel much better. So it's not just an item. You with me? As a matter of fact, does everybody know? I'm going to bring a good example. Ready? Call on me. Jeannie, call on me. I have a really good example that just came into my head. Thank you, Jeannie. What did the Jews have to do the night of Pesach before they left Mitzrayim? Blood. 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 And where did they have to put the blood? On the mezuzot. On the mezuzot. Huh? Huh? Good one, Tully. On the mezuzot and on the doorpost. What was the point? Because Hashem had to know who to skip. Are you sketching me? God needs the blood to know who is the Jewish house? Really? That's a precursor. You can't talk like that. You don't think God knows who's the Jewish home or not? He smells the chones. He knows who's the Jewish home. What's the answer? God is saying, show me that you believe me, right? Show me that you're not afraid of the Egyptians. Show me, right, that you trust me and you love me. You do that, and then I'll, then I'll skip. Put the mezuzah on, not just put the mezuzah on. You're putting a mezuzah on, and you go home and you eat not kosher. You put a mezuzah on, and you not eat not do girls. I didn't mean a mezuzah. You know, one puts a mezuzah they did not have, but he goes even further. Do you want to hear the real speech? You put a mezuzah on, you have five televisions in the house. Really? Okay, I didn't say. I didn't say that. I didn't say. That. I didn't say. That. Did I just say that? Right. Which means, what is the home? Is it a dira or is it a deer? To make this point. I want to show you a beautiful, this you should have known because I've said it often, Rabbi Fran says something amazing. The only thing is, I don't know what I'm going to do with this Father David, it's going to be funny. Okay, did you guys know, let's go back to the top. If you go to a Sephardi home, most Sephardic homes have the left image. What do I mean by the image on the left? Straight up and down. Straight up. Because Sephardim are straight up, not like Ashkenazim who, you know, I'm not kidding. Straight up, right, got that. If you go to most Ashkenaz homes, if not all, you'll see them tilted like this, right? Uh, Axalon, and with the head in. Okay, does anybody know halachically why that happened? We should compromise. Oh, 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 oh very good. Oh, wow, Ms. Amada, that was excellent. So wait, wait a second. Okay, so first of all, let me tell you the halacha. There are three, there are two shitot, two, two shitot. One shita says, she, I'm sorry, you guys know what shita is? Opinion. Okay, there are two opinions. One opinion is it should be straight up. And one opinion, believe it or not, it should be horizontal. Those are the two opinions. Okay? So the Svaradim go like the first opinion. Very nice. Yay. Very nice. In the Shulchan Aruch, the Rama says, since there are two opinions, let's compromise. You got it? Again, since there are two opinions, let's compromise. Ask Rabbi Friend, why of all times did we decide to compromise here? There, there are many two opinions in the Shulchan Aruch, right? That's we take right. either the first or the second opinion. Why are we compromising? This is Hamada, excellent. Says Rabbi Friend that when you walk into a home and you see the mezuzah is compromised, 
let it inspire you that your home has to be a place where you compromise. How nice is that? But it's the same idea. Do you understand? It, can I ask you, let's make you laugh. Let's make you laugh. Just because the mezuzah is compromised, that means I think you're never fighting with your husband again? Yeah. No way. Come on, come on, give it to me. Tell me. Yeah, that's me. We have a beautiful home. We have a beautiful relationship. You know what? You know how I know? Because I got a crooked mezuzah on my door. Yeah, really? That's how it works? Okay. We know it doesn't work that way. But the way it works is you walk into the home, you see it, it reminds you, you're inspired, and then you become a better person. This is one big picture. This is one big lesson that all of this teaches us. Okay? All right. I hope you liked it. All right. Here we go. Yeah. I even have a nice picture of uh, Shalom Bayit with a Jewish door. Look at that. Look how nice is that. Blue doors are in, by the way. Okay. Here we go. I want to show you something beautiful that I think that is important, especially for those of us like myself who struggle with, uh, you know, becoming a better person when it comes to eating. Okay, here we go. So last week was the end of Mishpatim, and this week is Tiruma, right? At the end of last week's parsha, after all of Mishpatim, there are two words that really, really, really uh, uh, define the Jewish people, two words that Hashem was very, very, very impressed. And those two words are the first time, by the way, the first time they appear is in chapter 24. <laughs> is And those two words are, you see it? Na'aseh benishma. Na'aseh benishma. Very impressive response from the Jewish people. By the way, what's so, so special about it? Watch, listen. Jeannie, Jean, can you do me a favor? Sure. Okay, so what did Jeannie just do? I said, Jeannie, can you do me a favor? And what did Jeannie just say? Yes. Did she ask me what the favor was? No. Oh, that's dangerous, Jeans. But that's what's called a relationship, right? If you have a relationship, oh, okay. If you have a relationship with somebody and you trust that person, I'm assuming we have one, therefore, and that's exactly what happened here. Naase, right? Venishma. We're ready to do. Nice. Okay. Ladies, did they do anything yet? Or they just said, They said. They said it. They were inspired and they made a commitment. Listen to this beautiful lesson. I, I, I love it. And you should teach this to your kids. This is basically the Okay, here we go. And then comes Parshat Shuma. Parashat Shuma follows Parashat Mishpatim, in which we read the, the beautiful words, Naseh Venishma. These words were recited by the children of Israel, time of the Torah. Immediately following the section, the Torah says, God said, speak to the children and let them, you know, take from me, they have to start donating to the Mishkan. The Baal Shem Tov, ladies, Baal Shem Tov, right? Founder of the Hasidic movement, one of the most spiritual people who ever lived in our world, said, <laughs> comments on this juxtaposition for those who don't know what that means what's the connection what's what's the closeness between Nasev and Ishma and building the Mishkan whenever a person is spiritually aroused it is important that he or she concentrize that inspiration by practical action to channel the arousal and give it a tangible physical manifestation you could speak to anybody who talks about you know uh, I, I don't know how to say this, but again, I don't mean to, I, I'm talking about myself. Somebody is inspired to lose weight. Somebody is inspired to be healthy. Somebody is inspired, take, do something now. Starting that day, take upon ourselves something and physically do something. That, how beautiful is that lesson? And it's important, which means inspiration alone is not enough. Do something. Do you know that? Uh, do you know the word? I mentioned this not often. You ever hear the word? Receive. To, to receive. A big word in Jewish spiritual growth is called a Kabbalah or a Kabbalah. Have you ever heard that? A Kabbalah. Right. A lot of girls and boys, but especially girls, you got to give girls credit. When they go to Israel in the seminary, they're taught, accept upon yourself a Kabbalah. You're inspired by something? Take something upon yourself. Uh, you know, a lot of girls take upon themselves to say Ashe Yatsar with more Kavanah. 
Uh, some people take upon themselves never to say Birkat HaMazon by heart, you know, to always, have you ever heard of all this? Uh, yeah. To use the Sidur, which means take that inspirational feeling and attach it to a, an action. How beautiful is that? And therefore, and who's teaching us that lesson? Hashem. Guys, you just said not seven Ishma. Let's have a building appeal. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I, I, we, should sh- we should send Hashem to all of our appeals, you know? Really? Really? You really love the yeshiva? All right. Give us a check, and then we'll see what happens. All right. So that's funny. But there's a second lesson, and it looks like we're getting to talk. But I love the second lesson, too. You ready? Okay. This is a nice saying. I, I don't believe what you say. How about this one? The distance between your dream and reality is called action. Beautiful. Oh, oh. And there's a great pasuk. Oh, ooh, put this pasuk on your, on your uh, refrigerator. It comes from Eicha. Look at this pasuk. New one. Nisa. Livavenu el kapayim, then el el bashamai. Oh, this is so beautiful. We should put this on a ring. Nisa livavenu. Let's lift up our hearts. So, what should go next? Who who are we lifting our hearts to? To Hashem, right? Right. No, but look what it says, Eleanor. No, lift your heart. Let us lift up our hearts. El kapayim to our what? To our hands. And then we lift it to Hashem, right? All talk, no action, not interested. Oh, that was nice. Okay. But then we have another question. I, I think you all know this question, and it's a great, great um, lesson. Let's go back to the Pasuk. <laughs> Hashem says, the bear al Israel, speak to the children of Israel. Okay, what's the problem? Come on, girls. Everybody should jump. Who should not be? It should be for it newly. Newly, right? A hundred percent. Again, every word in the Torah has a purpose. Uh, again, what's the question? Okay, let's go down. I have it actually here. And you shall take from me Chuma. This week's parsha contains a section of Torah that deals with the building of the Mishkan. The Torah tells us the Jewish people were commanded to bring a donation, right, to the Mishkan. But it says, Yichuli, right? It should say, Vietnuli, very good. Winston Churchill, we make a living, but what we get, we make a life, but what we give. But let's go further. Obviously, if you give, you're getting more. But look how this part, I'm going to read it because it's a really important lesson. I might even bring politics into it. Until that moment, the Jewish people had been recipients. Virtually everything they had experienced had been God-given. He redeemed them from Egypt, liberated them from slavery, went through the wilderness. We know all that. They were hungry, he gave them food. They were thirsty, he gave them water, right? Apart from the Amalek war, they did everything. Hashem did everything. Though at every physical level, that was unparalleled deliverance, the psychologists effect were not good. The Israelites became dependent, expectant, irresponsible, and immature. The Torah chronicles that they repeated complaints. Reading them, we feel that they were ungrateful, petulant people. But what are you going to do? Hashem had to do this. Let's go to the last one. Now, Hashem now gave them something that they had to do. The opportunity to give. Ladies, I, I, I don't want to start up with you. I am guilty. I am guilty. Not that I'm a better person. I'm a worse person. I'm not a good parent all the time. I always and continue to spoil my children. But that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. No, no. If you only, only give, some kids will not learn responsibility. They'll learn love. You're going to be the best Abba in the world. They have to learn responsibility. They have to not kvetch. They have to learn that you have to work for things. Look how important. Hashem said, up to now, I didn't have a choice with my little Jewish people. What am I going to do? They're going to split the sea, right? They're going to do dams fadeya. No, I had to do everything for them. Where are they getting food from? The man had to come from Shemayim. Where are they getting the water from? But now that they're building a mishkan, well, what, what, what could God have done? Poof, there's a mishkan. No, 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 no. You have to build the mishkan. And therefore, it says, you understand? They have to get from this, learn that they have to gain. How beautiful is that? They have to gain responsibility. Girls, I have to say this because I was listening to this on the news. I'm not saying Democrats. I'm not, I'm not saying anything. But forget about the political parties. A lot has been talked about that people are not around to work. Do you know that? Do you know that people couldn't, I'll tell you who, okay, one of our principals couldn't get on a flight. The flight was delayed because the stewardess decided not to show up. 
Just, I'm not coming. Have a good day. That to wait for another steward is to wake up and come. Another one, the pilot didn't show up. How many trucks are not being used because nobody's working? Why? Because you get so used to the government giving you tons of money. What do you want to work for? For what? What about the, what about the sense of responsibility? What about the sense of self-growth? That's what you get when you just give people things and don't. Okay, maybe you don't like what I'm saying. I believe in that. Yeah, I believe you have to enable by telling them that they have to work for it. Isn't that amazing that this is what the Torah is saying? And that's why Hashem said, and that's why he said, be cooly. We're good? Yeah? Should we do one more? Can we do one more? It's after two, one more? How about if I do one more and then we'll segue into it next time? It's probably not next week, probably in two weeks. Here it's the chapter. Okay, here we go. This is so beautiful. It's an easy one. And we'll learn a nice lesson. It's very famous. And let's move. Okay. Yeah, this is beautiful. So there were two Kalim that is discussed. There's the Aron, which we discussed already. And there's the Shulchan. Okay, to the left is the Shulchan. To the right is the Aron. Uh, what was on the Shulchan? What was the, it you? Lechem upon him. Lechem upon him. Mm-hmm. Right. Lechem upon him was on the Shulchan. So this is a famous thing. So I'm just going to mention it now. Do the first the first lesson, and we'll do the other lesson another time. But asu aron. And when you make the aron, you do it out of atzei team. We discussed that already, right? That's the inner box. Amatayim vachaiti arko. Two and a half amot, and amaz a foot and a half. So, but but it's a uh, it's a measurement. Amatayim vachaiti two and a half the uh, length. Ama vachesi kom rachbo and a an ama and a half is rocha and an ama and a half is height. Good. So it's two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. Good. Shulchan amatayim arko right the ama rachbo two by one. We'll get to the last one in a minute. Okay. So what pops up at you? The hands. The hands are strange. So when it comes to the aron. It's two and a half, one and a half by one and a half. Here, it's two by one. And we'll get to the last part. So if you're a builder, right, wouldn't it be much easier if you keep it whole? No? The half, so a little bit of a pain. Anybody remember the lesson? It's a famous one. I think it's that uh, we're never really there. We think we, we always have more to do. What about the shulchan? Words, we're incomplete. We have to, for, you know. To, to, know, what, about, what about the to shulchan? Achieve, uh, to achieve shleimus. But what about the shulchan? So why is the shulchan complete? Um, no, you're there. You're the, there. You're there. You're there. Very simple. What does the aron represent? Girls, come on. We said it before. Torah study. Torah study. Torah study. Torah study. Spiritual growth. What does the shulchan represent? Breakfast. Food. <laughs> Breakfast. Food. Yes. Yes. <laughs> very good. <laughs> That's gashmiut, right? That is physical, and that's spiritual. Very good. Now that you got it, Eleanor, which is when it comes to spiritual growth, there's always room for growth. growth. Or more, right? You're never complete. Very, very good. I, I don't know if you guys remember, I always told you, anybody ever learned Gemara here? Open a Gemara to the very first page. What's the letter on the first page of every Masechet? Bet, right. It starts on Daf Bet. What happened to Aleph, right? It's Aleph Bet. No Gemara has a Daf Aleph. Any Gemara. Isn't that amazing? For those who don't know, there is no Daf Aleph in Gemara. To teach you that you think you know it all, you don't even know the beginning. You have to start again. Crazy. But when it comes to breakfast, I like that, right? The breakfast... Even though all of us have gone to the uh, inbal, we never have enough breakfast. But yes, when it comes to when it comes to eating, when it comes to physical, we have to say, you know, we're happy with what we have. It's a beautiful lesson. Okay, so what's not answered? But I'm not going to do it now because it's late already. What's not answered is I'm, I'm a very you know I, you love my theory, but all of a sudden my theory ended with the last part. It says, but when it comes to the shulchan, it's two by one by one and a half. What happened to Bess's theory? So you know what we're going to do? We're going to do what we do on television. You have to stay tuned. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. Yeah, this is a cliffhanger. You're not getting this till <laughs> No, not that I don't want to tell you the answer. The answer is much bigger. So I don't have that much time. It's really, really nice to see everybody again. Really, really, really nice. Um,